tonight on CBC Vancouver News. But the vaccine card gives us is an alternative to more restrictive measures in many events and businesses and social situations. What you need to know, how will the BC vaccine card work? Can't come into our private business and blame the 20 year old staff member who is simply doing their job. Your only recourse at this point is to call the police. Local businesses gear up to implement the new system, but worry staff could take the brunt of frustrations and. So I donated a portion of my liver. Meet the BC woman who wanted to save a local child. Why she had to go to Ontario to make it happen. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We now know more about how BC's vaccine card is going to work when it's in place next week. And you can actually get a head start on registering your immunization record today. But the platform is already busy and has had long waits all day. Isabel Regem is here live now. Isabel, walk us through the process. What's going to happen? Well, you have to log on to the government website to register your shots, and the site has already been slammed with people trying to do so. Right now, you're looking at about an hour wait, and here are a few of the basics. As of September 13th, if you're 12 or older, you'll have to show proof of at least one dose if you want to access several non-essential services. Then by October 24th, you'll need to show you're fully vaxxed. You can use your paper card you received when you got your shot, but only until September 26th. After that, you'll need to get a QR code. Now, businesses will have to scan the QR code to see the status of vaccination, or they can do a VIC visual check. Dr. Henry says none of the data will be stored or collected. You'll need, at this point, proof at restaurants, including eating on a patio, going to the movies, ticketed sporting events and gyms. You will not need it to go grocery shopping, grab fast food, or to go to a th drive through While you can get your vaccine card online, there are other options. You can call a provincial line to get a copy mailed to you, or you can visit Service BC centers where they can print it out for you. Dr. Henry says if you don't bring this card into place, if we didn't bring this card into place, BC would likely have to introduce more restrictions. Ultimately, the choice is yours about whether you choose to be vaccinated or not. But what we need to do is make sure that we can continue um, to uh, keep things open as much as possible. And that's what the BC vaccine card is all about. Okay, so Isabel, I've been wondering this, and I'm sure many are. How will this actually be enforced? Well, fines mainly, Anita, and they can be issued by police officers, conservation officers, and liquor inspectors, among others. Up to $575 for an individual and $2,300 for an event organizer or operators of businesses. Today, Dr. Henry was asked about concerns over workers being targeted for enforcing these rules. Don't take it out on that business. Take it out on the virus. Take it out on... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, but let's uh, let's support our people who are are working hard in the hospitality industry. Now, when the order comes into effect next Monday, you will need to show a piece of photo ID with your vaccine card if you're 19 or older. People aged 12 to 18 will only need to show their vaccine status. Anita, this system is supposed to be in place until January 31st, but could be extended. Isabel Regan reporting live for us tonight. Thanks, Isabel. Thanks. And businesses and restaurants are quickly trying to get everything sorted so they can ask customers for their vaccination status at the door. As Eva Yuguen-Senj reports, the industry says the biggest hurdle will be people who refuse to cooperate. After weeks of uncertainty for restaurants... The process is going to be quite simple. Some relief with today's app-based vaccine card announcement. British Columbians are going to be flashing an app or a card uh, to get into any licensed establishment or any restaurant, bar or cafe. And we'll look at the app and confirm your identity and that's it, you're welcome to come in. Staff at gyms, restaurants, sporting events will be able to easily check someone's vaccine status. And customers' private information won't be stored. So when, a, when somebody like a restaurant or another business does scan it, they do see your information temporarily. It is not stored in the business. There is no record that's going to be persisting there. Still, there are warnings about sharing your vaccine card. 
you have a, an individual QR code that belongs to you. Please don't share pictures of this online. That is your vaccine passport. Most say the technology is simple and straightforward for businesses to implement. It's uncooperative customers that could make life difficult. Our challenge is, of course, going to be the customers who disagree and how we're going to make sure that we're training them to de-escalate. So industry is already working on some of those training programs, uh, but we've got a very short time frame to get this implemented. We only have six days. Last week, thousands protested the vaccine card and other pandemic measures. But the government says the system is not about limiting personal freedoms. This is not about restricting people's rights. This is about giving more rights to those who've taken steps to protect themselves. There will be no services denied to any British Columbians as a result of the vaccine card. The app for businesses to scan vaccine cards will be available next Monday, meaning staff will have to download and start using it that very same day. So not a lot of wiggle room for some technical speed bumps along the road. FIU Gwen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. COVID-19 cases in B.C. have plateaued over the Labor Day long weekend. More than 2,400 British Columbians tested positive for the virus. That averages to a little more than 600 a day. Deaths have increased. 15 more people have died this weekend. B.C.'s first dose vaccination rate had been stuck in the low 80s for months, but after a boost from the vaccine card announcement, it finally bypassed the 85 percent mark. And physicians in B.C. are being encouraged to go back to providing patients with in-person care. A letter from provincial health officials says while that online care was a necessity during the past 17 months of the pandemic, it's now time to shift back to seeing patients in person. Officials are stressing that COVID-19 is now considered a vaccine preventable virus and with personal protective gear, it is safe for doctors to welcome their patients into the office again. Well, it was a busy morning for parents today, sending their kids off on the first day of school. We spoke to a few families about how they feel entering into another school year under COVID. And while the kids are basking in the back to school fanfare, some parents have worries about the eased restrictions. Um, I'm pretty okay with it, except the fact that they won't be letting us know if someone in the class had the virus. So. I am so exciting. I'm, I'm just still concerned of that the school board hasn't mandated the, the mask mandates for K to 12. Uh, I don't see the huge problem with it. She doesn't have a problem with wearing a mask. I, I will trust school. They will handle well because they had a year experience. They, will ha they know what to do. What are you most excited about? Recess. Friends. And yeah. recess. Aren't we all excited for recess? Okay, and with school back in session, police and ICBC are reminding you to slow down and stay attentive when you're driving through those school zones. Last year, close to 7,000 speeding tickets were issued at school and playground zones. Failure to obey the 30-kilometer speed limit could cost you a fine of at least $196. If you pass a stopped school bus with the lights flashing, that's $368. Cyclists are also expected to adhere to speed regulations. There hasn't been a lot of student traffic in and around schools during the pandemic. So this September, it is more important than ever to remind all road users to be vigilant on the roads, especially in school zones. The VPD is reminding everyone to always yield to pedestrians on the crosswalk to put phones away and not drive distracted. For students, they're advised to take precautions while crossing the street, such as making eye contact with drivers, wearing bright clothing and not using headphones. Well, the pandemic restriction that kept most international visitors out of the country has now been lifted. Foreign travelers can now fly into Canadian airports and cross the border without doing that 14-day quarantine. At the airport, international travelers already started arriving bright and early today. We are very happy that we can now come and study. Well, it is really good to start seeing people again and being able to fly and safely. It was good. I'm going to school in Vancouver, so I'm glad that I was able to come and my classes on online, so I'm happy about that. YVR says even with the relaxed restrictions, the airport is still only seeing about half the traffic it would normally at this time of year. There are conditions to the new border rules, however, according to one expert, they will help keep COVID transmission low. But when we actually think about the policy, we know that everyone who's entering Canada has to be fully vaccinated with a Canadian approved vaccine and, of course, has to have a negative test within 72 hours. 
Those are two very, very good, but of course not perfect mechanisms to ensure that people coming into the country don't have COVID. This all comes a month after American non-essential travelers got the green light to enter. Both changes happening, of course, as case counts in the fourth wave of the pandemic are climbing higher in this country. She wanted to donate part of her liver to help a save, save a child. Turns out doing that in B.C. isn't even possible. Janella Hamilton tells us why the Vancouver nurse had to travel to Ontario to do it. This would have been probably a day after the transplant surgery. 23-year-old Julia King has spent much of her life helping others. The nurse often donates blood, is signed up for the stem cell registry, and was looking for a way to help those in need of a liver transplant. But was surprised to learn BC's living transplant program is for kidney donations only. If that was one of my family members or friends, I'd want to help them with a live donation. BC Transplant says living liver surgeries were performed at Vancouver General Hospital between 2001 and 2015. Since then, there has been a greater availability of deceased donor livers for BC patients. But some doctors say living donations lead to a better survival rate. It goes from one room to the other room. So the preservation of the organs is also much shorter rather than waiting from an organ that has to be transferred from a donor center to a transplant center. BC Transplant says they plan to restart the living liver program in 2020, but efforts were stalled because surgeons and staff were not able to travel to get the necessary training during the pandemic. Some patients that come in with liver failure, but they're not sick enough to be on the transplant list, sometimes they'll try and do the donation sooner before the patient's too sick. According to the Canadian Institute for Health Information, there are just under 500 people in Canada who are waiting for a liver transplant, with about 36 of those patients in BC. For some of those who are waiting, they will either die or withdraw from the wait list before ever receiving the transplant they need. Every year we lose somewhere around 25 to 30 percent of patients. There are only two living liver transplant programs in Canada, one in Toronto and the other in Edmonton. King was matched with a child through the living liver donor program in Toronto. Since the donation couldn't be facilitated here in BC, she traveled to Ontario last month for the transplant surgery. BC Transplant hopes to resume the program within the next few years, but the pandemic continues to create barriers. Now that King is home and healed, she is looking forward to writing a letter to the young child who received part of her liver. It's great just the feeling that you're able to help someone in that way. She hopes more people become aware that the Living Liver program is available. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. More than 20 years later, a man has pleaded guilty to the murder of a 27-year-old Kamloops mother. Trent Larson has pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in the 2000 killing. Angel Fair was a mother of two and five months, pregnant with her third child. The Kamloops woman was reported missing by her family. The now 53-year-old Trent Larson was her boyfriend at the time. Friends and family are mourning an artist found dead in Victoria last week. 49-year-old Jeremy Gordonier was found inside his home and police believe someone killed him. Christina Jung spoke with his wife, who is still in shock. A widow in disbelief. I was in Edmonton and I didn't receive a phone call. The police came to my door. And they delivered the horrific news. I mean, I think everyone can imagine what that what that moment is like. Yeah, I have a daughter as well, and I just said, thought to myself, it's either my daughter or it's Jeremy, and here we go. Yeah. Victoria police found her husband here, the Rockland neighborhood, at around 5 a.m. on August 31st. A witness reported hearing a pop, pop, pop noise. 49-year-old artist Jeremy Gordoner was alive when officers arrived, but later died from his injuries. It makes no sense, and I think when that happens, um, people, it really, it's really touching. Uh, people, are, people are, like, sh shaken a little bit. So I, I've had a lot of, a lot of disbelief and, and, like, kind of shaken to the core because it's so un, 
unforeseen and so bizarre. Patterson and Gordoner went to high school together near Victoria in Oak Bay. They reconnected years later and got married in 2018. She says her husband's life was cut short just as he was about to dive into a new artistic endeavor. He, he had just finished his master's in scenic design and taken the decision to, to really um, try and build that part of his practice and, and see if he could, he could really go much further with it. Um, and so that all of that potential just, you know, is gone. Gordon Year worked on many projects with artists on Vancouver Island, Montreal, Ottawa and Edmonton. Truly, he was incredibly gifted excelling at everything he touched. He could just do anything. If we needed something drawn, he could draw it. Um, if we needed to build something, he could build it. Um, we had an understanding of aesthetic, but he could work outside of that as well. I think that's what other people found. Gordon Neer's death is being investigated as a homicide. Patterson says she was told by police that the death is suspicious. He's gone and that's that's pretty much the end of it. I can't think too much about it because there, there's, there's really no information. It's not going to change anything. The investigation is still in its early stages, but police hope someone may have information and will come forward to help solve the case. Christina Jung, CBC News, Vancouver. While it may feel like the summer is over, officials are still busy battling wildfires across the province. Right now, there are 211 wildfires burning. Nine of the blazes are considered wildfires of note, including the White Rock Lake Fire southeast of Kamloops. Earlier today, the Thompson-Nicola Regional District lifted all of its remaining evacuation alerts as the fire no longer poses a risk to the safety of people living in the area. Cooler weather over the last two weeks brought a slight break, but the BC Wildfire Service says recent warm, dry weather in the interior is causing an increase in wildfire behavior. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is here now. And Joe, here on the south coast, uh, I believe no fire danger right now. You can correct me there, but I want to say it was really almost a perfect day. Oh, I felt the same, Anita. It was a gorgeous Tuesday. I know it was back to school, whether it was 15 minutes or a full day for kids uh, across the South Coast, but it was a center. Let me show you uh, the current temperatures right now. It's a lovely evening. If you didn't get to enjoy it, it's still a few hours left. 20 at YBR right now. Abbotsford, 27. Uh, so feeling the summer heat today, along with beautiful blue skies, just some of that high cirrus, the uh, wispy stuff, making for an interesting blue sky. Uh, low pressure off towards Pai de Gwai is bringing that steady stream of rain uh, to the central and northern coast. That's what brought us the high cloud today. I'm watching this system south of the border uh, that will get, get a little more organized through the overnight. And you can see the showers tracking up uh, the Oregon heading into Washington coast. That's what may bring us a few showers tomorrow morning. So I'm thinking pre-dawn, there we go, 5 a.m. snapshot. We'll see those showers track in across Metro Vancouver. They don't last long. Uh, most of the models indicating they lift out by sort of 11 a.m. and we'll get back to the sunshine. So we need a, just a blip in the forecast. I might have another blip on Thursday before we get back to some summer weather, but uh, the long range forecast details coming up in a bit. Not bad. We'll talk to you soon, Joe. Sounds good. Well, it almost didn't happen because of the pandemic. <clears throat> Excuse me. But thousands still turned out for BC's iconic summer fair at the PE. In a normal year, the fair would welcome almost 750,000 people. This year's event was a little smaller with limited capacity. More than 239,000 guests visited over a 15 day period. And while it may have been a smaller fair, there, of course, was still all those mini donuts galore. And yes, this year I tried the new mini glazed donut. Um, it was tasty, but I think I'll be sticking to the traditional minis next year. All right, you are watching CBC Vancouver News at 6. I'm your host, Anita Bath, and I just want to remind you, you can catch our program on our free app, CBC Gem, Facebook, or YouTube. Well, they aren't polling very high, but even at 5 or 6 percent, the People's Party is turning heads this election. Why Maxim Bernier's party could play a spoiler. That's next.
Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. A Manitoba farmer known for his elaborate 10 acre corn mazes has set up a special display to pay tribute to victims of residential schools. And it gives people an opportunity to learn more about what happened. Have a look. Today we are opening the Every Child Matters, I call it a corn garden, is it's less of a maze, more of a garden. It's for contemplation, it's to think about uh, residential schools. But we felt it after the discovery of the 215 unmarked graves in Kamloops, um, it just impacted me, it impacted our staff. We have Métis staff, we have people of different nations, tribes and backgrounds. And this was really our response, is we should do something. Here we are today under the beautiful sun on a nice fall day, uh, walking through a, a corn maze, um, you know, championing every child matters. Vince and I actually had a conversation and, and uh, you know, in light, of, in light of the awareness that was happening, uh, it literally uh, a couple of months back when, when the, the initial discovery of the graves were, were brought forward, Vince gave me a call and we spoke a couple times and we, we spoke earnestly about the idea of developing the corn maze this year in reference to, you know, the history of, of residential school and, and uh, working towards that in a, in a meaningful and, and, and respectful way. All the things that we have in the maze are designed to tell a story, educate people. I'm hoping people will learn, they'll grow, and uh, their attitudes will be, you know, changing. It's through initiatives like this where our communities can collaborate and, and come together to create some understanding, to, to create an opportunity of learning, to bring everybody together. If you or someone you know is looking for support, you can reach the National Residential School Crisis Line at 1-866-925-4419. It operates 24 hours and is available for anyone impacted by the lingering effects of residential schools. The federal election is heading into its final stretch and things are heating up. Political attacks are on the increase and the angry protests that have been following Justin Trudeau have escalated. As Marina von Stackelberg reports, police in London, Ontario are now investigating a stone throwing incident at a campaign event there yesterday. <laughs> Sprayed by gravel, Justin Trudeau says he was hit by the small stones, but not injured. The Liberal leader was boarding his bus during a campaign stop in London, Ontario on Labour Day, when angry protesters surrounded him. This is not who we are as a country. In Montreal today, Trudeau says he is inspired by healthcare workers who also face what he calls anti-vaxxer mobs. It's not just a political rallies that this is happening. There are healthcare workers across the country who are getting hassled and intimidated and bullied as they're going into work to keep people safe and alive. Across Canada, protesters have surrounded busy areas, including hospitals, a response to provinces bringing in COVID-19 passports. This event will no longer be taking place here today. Justin Trudeau already had to cancel one campaign event because of safety concerns. 
Many protesters in yesterday's crowd waved signs for the People's Party of Canada. Their leader, Maxime Bernier, was egged at a campaign stop last week in Saskatoon. He says no leader spoke out against what happened to him. On Twitter this morning, he wrote, Some idiot threw pebbles at Mr. Trudeau yesterday. I condemn it. Words are our weapons. But physical violence is always wrong. The other leaders were quick to denounce what happened to Trudeau over the weekend. I don't agree with Mr. Trudeau's approach on many things, but I respect his ability to be able to communicate with Canadians free of harassment, intimidation and violence. It is absolutely wrong to be throwing stones. I mean, I can't imagine that I'm saying this in 2021. Don't throw stones at people because you disagree with them. Justin Trudeau says despite the protests, he will press ahead but will look to the RCMP for advice on security. He will also leave it up to the Mounties to decide whether charges are warranted. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, despite some controversy, Maxime Bernier has seen his party overtake the Greens, according to CBC polls. Our Karen Paul sat down for a one-on-one -on -one with the party leader and spoke to supporters to learn more about what's behind the growing support. Maxime Bernier says his main message is a fight for freedom. There's a lot of people that are doing that fight with us. Including his supporters who protest at Justin Trudeau's rallies. I want to show you this picture from last night, yeah. the Trudeau rally. Yeah. Have you asked them, dis discouraged them from doing that and denounced that? No, I don't control these people, but they're doing that peacefully. He said that Monday morning, but after gravel was thrown at Trudeau, Bernier tweeted, Some idiot threw pebbles at Mr. Trudeau yesterday. I condemn it. Words are our weapons, but physical violence is always wrong. Bernier notes when he was egged last week in Saskatoon, none of the other leaders came to his defense. The people of Canada choose change and can get change. Bernier has become the political champion for some opponents of vaccination passports and mask mandates. He himself was charged for defying Manitoba public health orders in June when he failed to do a two-week quarantine. What if you're arrested again today? I, I'm, I'm taking a chance uh, and uh, we'll see. But if I have to go back to jail to defend our freedoms and the freedom of our Canadians, I'll do that. In parts of Manitoba with the lowest vaccine uptake, that is very popular. I want to stand up. I want to stand up for our freedoms in this country. Maxime Bernier is the only politician out there who is talking about that. So could he have an impact on Election Day? I think in Ontario, especially where the Liberals and the Conservatives are close, the PPC could potentially drain votes from the Conservatives enough to let the Liberals get in. If this is going to be a minority parliament, and it probably will, that small number of seats could potentially make a difference. Still, for a growing number of people, Bernier is giving voice to their concerns, concerns they hope he will take to Ottawa. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Video acquired by the CBC has triggered a review of an arrest in Ottawa. It shows police officers punching a suspect who was taken into custody back in May. The CBC's Judy Trin tells us the department is now looking into whether appropriate force was used. There was a couple of masks on the floor and then down the hall when I went down later there was uh, some drops of blood uh, outside the elevators. Beverly Hobbs could see police through the peephole and hear the commotion on the 14th floor of her building. A constable told her to stay inside her apartment. Hobbs didn't know what happened that day until CBC showed her a short video captured on cell phone. It bothers me anytime anybody's hurting somebody. The surveillance video from May shows three Ottawa police officers arresting a 39-year-old man. One officer takes him to the ground. A second officer rushes to help, punching and knee-striking the suspect, while a third holds the man's legs. The suspect is hit 19 times in 24 seconds. I do think that th this is excessive and brutal. University of Winnipeg criminologist Kevin Walby studies police use of force. He says the man only moves when the hits begin. Walby says it's possible the suspect was writhing in pain. The book, you know, it has these rules like the one plus one rule. And if you're not facing any level of force, then it's not justified to, to use some higher level of force. The first officer was having a, 
a tough time. I Retired officer Larry Hill times. also viewed the footage. The former deputy police chief in Ottawa says officers are trained to use strikes to the midsection to gain compliance. To Hill, it looks like the man was resisting arrest. It looked to me as though they were trying to get the uh, suspect's uh, arm out from under him in order to affect the handcuffing. Ottawa police say the arrest was part of a drug investigation that began three days earlier. Police had tried to apprehend the suspect, but he fled in a vehicle. And while driving away, he hit an officer. As part of their review, police say they will look at all available surveillance video. They will also interview the suspect, who is currently in jail, facing eight charges, including possession of crack cocaine, driving dangerously, and assaulting an officer. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. The Taliban has announced the formation of a new interim government in Afghanistan. And although they'd promised a more inclusive Islamic society, as Susan Ormiston reports, those chosen for the top posts in the caretaker cabinet suggest a different story. What's to note here is this new interim caretaker government is composed of hardline Taliban leaders, many of whom have been in the movement for over 20 years. The interim prime minister, for example, led the Taliban during the last time it was in power in Kabul more than 20 years ago. So some names, the interim prime minister, as we've noted, is Mullah Hassan Ahund. He is seen as an influential figure on the religious side. Uh, one of his deputies is the head of Taliban's political bureau, Mullah Abdul Hani Baradar. He led the Taliban's delegation on the peace talks in Qatar, a very well-known man to the West. And two members of the infamous Haqqani Network, considered a U.S. terrorist group sanctioned by the U.S. and the U.N. Interior Minister Sirajuddin Haqqani will be in government in a very important position and this will be uh, very difficult for the international community to accept. Also, no women in cabinet, no diversity. When asked about that, the Taliban spokesperson said more names could be added and will be added to the cabinet, but there's no indication that women will take a leadership role that had been communicated and messaged earlier in this month. What does the caretaker government mean? Well, it means there will be more people coming into the government. It also could mean that they couldn't come up with a full list of names suitable to the different factions uh, in the Taliban and they will have to do further negotiations, but they couldn't wait much longer. It's been three weeks since Kabul fell to the Taliban. And there are, as we've seen over the last few weeks, increasing tensions, economic concerns in the country, which are ratcheting up con uh, concerns and fears in this vacuum of government. So they've started with an interim caretaker government, much more to come, and there will be much analysis of this in the coming days. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Islamabad. You may be up for a third dose of the COVID vaccine sooner than you thought. What we know coming up. Summer ends tomorrow for millions of Canadian school children. Most are going back to classes where they'll be liked and accepted, but not everyone. Some children in some of our larger cities aren't going to be accepted because their skin isn't white and because they don't speak English very well. In British Columbia, one school district is trying to do something about that. Russ Patrick does that story. In Vancouver, just before the school term starts, principals and vice principals get together to talk about things such as courses they're going to offer. But this year, their preschool workshops were devoted to a single topic, how to combat racism in Vancouver schools. Yes. The city's school age population is a complex of minorities. 40% of the students speak English as a second language. Several racially motivated incidents, including fistfights and brawls, took place in and around Vancouver schools last year. Kogila Adam Moodley is a specialist in ethnic education. She spoke to the school administrators. I think these people are in an extremely important position in the role of authority that they have in regard to the lives of students. And they really do have the power in, in many respects to change uh, the kind of curriculum that is offered. 
as well as talking about things such as solving intercultural problems, confronting stereotypes, and teaching in a multi-ethnic society, the administrators were shown films about minority groups. One of them, a National Film Board documentary about a 13-year-old Sikh who lives on a dairy farm near Vancouver. Teachers are encouraged to show this kind of film in their own classroom. The superintendent of Vancouver schools thinks racism in schools is a major national problem, and the teachers and parents are going to have to deal with that problem. I think the schools do reflect uh, society, and there is no question but that uh, uh, the, the parents will have to be introduced to a number of these concerns so that they can work cooperatively with the schools in order to uh, promote better relations. Some administrators at the Vancouver workshop were concerned that racist attitudes may be so deeply embedded in young people's minds that they're impossible to change. Kugila Adam Moodley doesn't agree. I don't believe that. I believe that schools still can make a difference. And this is precisely the area that we try to work at changing. Russ Patrick, CBC News, Vancouver. And that's our newscast for tonight. I'm Nolton Nash. Good night. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. To do a living donation, you can go through Toronto or Alberta. A BC nurse is sounding the alarm after she tried to donate part of her liver to save a sick child. Turns out the province has stopped doing living liver transplants. That means if someone wants to donate, they'd have to go to Ontario or Alberta. The Canadian border is now open to fully vaccinated international travelers. That means no quarantine will be required if you have both jabs. Canada opened its doors to Americans nearly a month ago. BC businesses are hoping this will all help with the bottom line. And the province has officially launched its BC vaccine card. Starting today, you can go online and register your immunization record, and the system goes into place on Monday. You'll then need to show your proof of vaccine to access many non-essential businesses. COVID-19 in Alberta has taken a dire turn. Over the long weekend, almost 5,000 Albertans tested positive. Active cases are at more than 15,000. It's almost three times that of B.C. Aaron Collins shows us how the situation evolved and the strain it's putting on the health care system. A nurse for 40 years, the last 20 in a Calgary intensive care unit, but just 18 months of COVID has taken its toll. We're just frustrated and tired and wish we didn't have to deal with this again. Her ICU already scrambling to make more space, preparing to double bunk COVID patients. Still, she worries it won't be enough this time. I dread the day that the physician has to decide whether a 25-year-old will get a vent or a 50-year-old will get a vent. A familiar lament as cases continue to surge in Alberta to slow this fourth wave, the province now dangling $100 in front of the unvaccinated. An unpopular move for some at this Edmonton vaccination clinic. I think it's ridiculous that they've had to go to this extent instead of managing things a little more effectively early. Well, no surprise, the opposition is critical of the government's response to continuing to push for vaccine passports. Do the right thing, allow those who have gotten vaccinated, who are protecting themselves and their communities to be able to have access to the things that they enjoy in life. A province-wide mask mandate is back. Sales of liquor at bars now stops at 10. But will it all be enough to bend the curve in time? You have to wait two weeks, normally 10 days, to see uh, an effect on the exponential growth rate. How much have we bent down the curve in Alberta? But the problem is going to be if the ICUs are full, you don't have a lot of time to play with. 
the worry that Alberta waited too long to act, that this latest wave will soon come crashing down on the province's health care system. The UK has reported 37,000 new COVID-19 infections today, nearly 10 times Canada's daily caseload. That's the latest surge, still fueled by the Delta variant. Despite this uptick, life in London looks pretty much near normal. As Chris Brown reports, it's raising concerns among experts about some people acting like the pandemic is over. A surge of new COVID infections is sweeping across Britain, but looking around London, you'd never know it. It's done. COVID is over. For sure. Everyone's vaccinated. I'm double vaxxed. I'm proud to be double vaxxed. I think everyone should be vaccinated and the numbers are going to keep going. It's just like the common cold now. Nightclubs are packed too. And in the West End, Andrew Lloyd Webber has debuted his new production of Cinderella and social distancing isn't even required. On London's Tube, with a lot of people no longer working from home, ridership this week has surged with more trips to the office. Face masks are still mandatory on trains, but not enforced and lots of people ignore the signs. Fueling the sense of living in a post-COVID world is the disconnect between all of the new COVID cases hovering around 40,000 a day, but very low hospitalizations. Only 7% of the UK's hospital beds are filled with COVID patients. There is significant protection and immunity right now, fortunately built up largely through vaccines, which means that we are in a stronger position than we were last year. The worrying area of concern, though, remains young people. Unlike in Canada, 12 to 15-year-olds in the UK have not been approved for vaccinations, and it's in younger age groups where infections are spiking, which is still dangerous, says this expert. The problem with having high transmission rates, even if hospitalisation rates don't soar, is that the higher the transmission rate, the more mutations. The more mutations, the more variants. And the more variants, the more likely there is to be a variant that escapes the vaccine even more. So, as London's streets grow congested again, with the return to near normal, some experts fear the elements are in place for a strong resurgence this fall and winter, and that even having 70% of the population double vaccinated won't be enough to stop it. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Here in our country, Delta is also the dominant variant driving up our cases. And with growing questions about the need for booster shots, many are wondering how they'd work to protect against new variants. As Vicodopia reports, the science surrounding that has yet to be settled. It doesn't take much for Andrea Horowitz to get sick. She's been on medication to suppress her immune system ever since her liver transplant. You're used to this. I mean, since I was 30 years old, I never went anywhere without washing my hands or, you know, I used my feet to open doors. I, you know, it's just part of the life. So when she was offered a third COVID-19 shot... They said I could come, I ran. Booster shots can be used in a few ways, typically as a third dose of the same vaccine for people with compromised immune systems or for those with waning immunity, such as older people or those who had two shots early in the pandemic. Or it could be as a new vaccine, redesigned specifically for emerging variants of the coronavirus, such as Delta. So we're all waiting for the data from Pfizer and Moderna that will tell us whether you get a better antibody level out of the out of a Delta specific booster versus a regular booster. The vaccines approved so far were designed to target the original version of the coronavirus and its spike protein, which it uses to penetrate our defenses. But that spike protein has undergone mutations, creating new variants, which researchers have now genetically sequenced. Then you have the sequence of this new uh, uh, spike protein. You have that, uh, you can just swap out that sequence uh, and then uh, use that vaccine. The worry is, without a new booster shot, we'll see more breakthrough infections. But so far, researchers say Canada is doing better than other countries, partially because of our delay between doses, which resulted in a stronger immune response. We do potentially have the luxury of time to wait and see what the data from elsewhere is telling us. Now, that said, though, we need to continue monitoring uh, breakthrough cases with Delta. I want to live. <laughs> I don't want to get COVID. 
For some Canadians, no amount of protection is too much. Vic Adopia, CBC News, Toronto. A young group of Canadian tennis players is going on a tear at the U.S. Open, and they are just the latest in Canucks stars. What's the reason for their success? Well, that's next. And at 6.43, a live look at Hanson Island in the Queen Charlotte Strait. The beauty of a day today, and it could be the norm for a bit, with the exception of a little blip. Johanna has the long range coming up after the break. If you'd like to attract hummingbirds into your backyard, it should be quite simple. Most hummingbird feeders will be a bit like this, red base, and that's a good thing because hummingbirds look for red things. Put it up somewhere in front of your window, somewhere you can see it. You want to see hummingbirds close, right? They will come close. So it's really easy to make the sugar water that goes into a hummingbird feeder. Just under a cup of sugar. And then I'm going to mix it with about four cups of water. Give it a really good shake. And there you have it. The wonderful thing about these birds is that next year, that hummingbird may well be back to your window because they remember where the feeders are. Canada's historic run at the U.S. Open continues tonight with another epic win from rising star Leila Fernandez, now heading to the semifinals. She's one of a growing number of Canadians stunning the tennis world. Thomas Degla explains how they're inspiring players here at home. Inspiration from the Canadian. Who would have thought she'd make it this far and still keep winning? 19-year-old Leila Fernandez upsetting fifth seed Alina Svitolina the latest star to fall to the unseated, underestimated Canadian who's tearing up the U.S. Open. I just told myself to trust my shots, trust that everything's going to go well. Even if I lose, I got to go for it, and I'm glad I did. 
Fernandez stunned the tennis world last week by defeating reigning champion Naomi Osaka. Then she upset veteran Angelique Kerber, setting the stage for this quarterfinal. And the love affair with New York. We're summoning in the new generation of tennis players, and I think Canada has a place there. Two years ago in New York, it was Bianca Andreescu leading a new wave, the first Canadian to win a Grand Slam singles title. This summer, Denis Shapovalov reached the Final Four at Wimbledon, with Felix Oje Aliassim not far behind. At 21 years old, he too is on a roll, competing in his own quarterfinal match tonight. Be amazing for us to lead our country. To Speaking to us in 2019, Oji Aliassim already predicted there was more to come from Canada. We also feel the energy coming from the people at home, the interest that they give uh, when you see the, num the numbers going up of people, you know, trying out tennis, uh, watching tennis. It's just uh, very encouraging for us. Just check out the lineup at this Toronto tennis shop. With more fans picking up outdoor sports in a pandemic, and amid Canada's hot streak. People are coming in, mentioning the matches, and sometimes people that don't even play tennis are coming in saying they're watching the Canadians. So it's very exciting. And why is that? What is it that they're feeding you up north in Canada that is producing such incredible, inspiring tennis this week? I would say it's the maple syrup. A sweet result, no matter what's fueling her. The Canadian maple syrup. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Awesome stuff. And right now, Canadian mm -hmm. uh, Felix Auger Aliasim is playing in the quarterfinal, leading at the moment, in case you were wondering, Joe. Um, okay, speaking of hot streaks, is that what we yes. are on right now? <laughs> <laughs> I love that, Anita. Yes. And I was wondering, I was uh, storm tracking in Ontario earlier today, and uh, someone reminded me that the Open was happening. So, uh, yes, I am staying tuned as I am staying tuned to the uh, summer weather. We have more hot temperatures around the corner. We will gradually see as those shorter days and the sun angle changes, we will gradually gradually see fall descend upon us, but uh, we've got a summer week ahead. Let me take you to the big picture. As I mentioned earlier, one low pressure system tracking up to the north as another moves in from the south. So it's the southern low pressure system that will be bringing us the rain through tomorrow morning before we get back, getting back to the sunshine. And then on the back end of that low, looks like we'll have another hit for Thursday and the timing of Thursday is shifting a little bit. So I'll talk more about that in a moment for tomorrow. Another summer like day across the southern interior. Uh, we will be watching for some smoke across the southern interior. Smoky Skies Bulletin has been reissued for the Okanagan through to the Kootenays. That is for smoke coming up from Washington. And we are getting close to that one year anniversary of the uh, wildfire smoke that came up from uh, south of the border last fall, uh, end of summer into fall. Uh, we're just seeing that for a couple of days in the southern interior, but heads up, uh, smoky skies expected because of a shift in winds thanks to that low pressure system. Uh, you can see rain should spread across to most of BC, and we do still need it in the interior, as we talked about uh, earlier in the show. Wildfire danger is creeping up because of the uh, long and dry and warm stretch we've been in, but temperatures aren't explosive, so we're seeing them stay below the 30 degree mark for the most part across the uh, southern interior. But again, it's that dry stretch that has really elevated the risk. So getting a few showers tomorrow uh, before things dry right back out for the end of the week. You can see temperatures across the south, though, in general, all pretty seasonal as we head into the second half of the week. And we actually start to dip down for early next weekend. But I don't see a big return to fall summer, uh, fall summer weather. Uh, I'm coining that for fall and full, full weather until early next week. So look at this. We have seasonal temperatures right through to the weekend. It's Tuesday, Wednesday, next week. A little far out for the forecast models to hang your hat on, but I would say it's sort of September 15th, 16th that will actually legitimately feel like fall. So tomorrow, look for those showers in the morning before we get back to the sunshine. I've got AM rain there on Thursday, but the latest model runs that just come out actually shifted towards the afternoon. There will certainly be some sunny breaks on Thursday, but I'll try and hone in on that timing tomorrow. Uh, drying back out for Friday. And Anita, it looks like a nice summer weekend. We're uh, grasping at those last summer weekends, but we've got another one ahead for sure. Holding on as long as we can. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Britney Spears' father has filed a petition to end his daughter's 13-year conservatorship. The singer's father, Jamie Spears, is saying she should get the chance to once again handle her own life. The move marks another legal victory for the pop star. Last month, her father had agreed to offer her more control, but it offered no timetable. 
It's a playground like you've never seen before. How one artist has taken his painting to another dimension. That's next. You can't fly drones all the time. And it might seem like common sense, uh, but we found that uh, weather is actually a big limiting factor. You need to have good weather conditions to fly a drone safely. And so we wanted to look at that um, globally, how often you could fly a drone safely uh, around the world. So we took uh, a look at some of the, the most popular drones in North America. When can you fly? Can you fly in, in precipitation? What temperature range can you fly in? And what wind speeds you can fly in? That was part of the data collection. And then we compared that with uh, the about 10 years of, of weather data from around the world. In general, uh, you can fly about 50% of the time in uh, some of the higher flyability areas in Canada, like Vancouver and Toronto, about 45% uh, in, in Calgary. And then as you move into some of the more challenging areas uh, and uh, weather-wise, so up in the Northwest Territories uh, and Yukon, you get down to 20%, 30% of the time. Uh, certainly it's, it's useful data. I mean, we've done our own studies because we've flown in uh, summer, winter, rain, and, and snow. So we would certainly be subject to, uh, to variations in the weather. But, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, fairly robust uh, systems that manage uh, navigation and stability, um, you know, through a variety of, uh, of technologies, whether they're on board or us being able to uh, monitor weather and, uh, you know, vary the route depending on, on you know, expected weather. But uh, technology is a, is a factor, but there, there are always going to be limitations, uh, again, with any means of transportation, air, air included. The most popular drones out there um, can benefit from a little bit of weatherproofing. And if there's just even a little bit of, of um, resistance to precipitation, then drones can fly a lot more often. Uh, in a lot of places. If you look at the use cases for drone delivery, they're typically uh, threefold. Hard to access areas, uh, which could be e-commerce and a variety of things, First Nations communities, rural communities, uh, but healthcare is a, is a big part of that because sometimes you've got instances where access is difficult and that, that impacts uh, lives. And then you've also got uh, where time is critical. Uh, so maybe you can get there, but if I can get there with a drone, uh, that makes all the difference. The most traction uh, for drone delivery has been healthcare related. Uh, I mean, you, you see a lot of videos delivering coffee and muffin and whatever to somebody's home, and you know, other people are posting those kind of things. And that's, I would say, a bit more hype than than reality today. Manufacturers and the drone industry should include um, higher levels of weatherproofing, especially for temperature and precipitation, uh, so that. Uh, Canadian cities that experience more extreme temperatures uh, don't get left behind. Hi, I'm Amy Bell and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. September is Literacy Month. Have fun and support the cause by joining CBC Vancouver's Dan Burrett at the Virtual Team Trivia Challenge. Register and learn more at dakota.ca. And join CBC Vancouver's Angela Sterrett at the Ravens Feast Gala and Art Auction, a virtual art and culture experience in support of the Bill Reed Gallery. Get tickets and learn more at billreedgallery.ca. Students are back to school this week under a number of COVID rules and restrictions, but for two New Brunswick elementary schools, there's also something new to look forward to on the playground. Have a look. So I'd like to add that 3D illusion to make it look like things are floating or things are lifted or things drop down. It gives the illusion. It's a bit better than the flat paint. You know, I mean, I love to add that little extra. I do the uh, 3D hopscotch, the uh, snakes and ladder games, obstacle courses, some beanbag tossing games, 
um, some large snakes with letters and numbers in them for educational purposes. And uh, four square, king square, I guess it's called. We do those as well. I'm trying to add a 3D effect to everything and so it's not so, not such a plain area for the kids. And, but mostly it's for the kids because now they're trying to generate all the kids outside. So we really want to get some stuff outside for them. I think it's good for kids to see the process of what it takes to make something look 3D and how different it looks when you look at it from different perspectives. It's an interesting um, angle, literally and figuratively, for them to take maybe two in their art classes to get some experience with the art like that. They're all hands-on, but uh, I think the 3D illusion is what kind of sets them apart from the other playground games. That bit. It's a bit more to them. It's not just, it's actually art and I try to combine the art and the, the playground together. Yeah. Great stuff. All right. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We are back here tomorrow night at six, but if you want more news tonight, Isabel Regam is in for Dan at 11 o'clock. Have a good evening.